Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Dear friends, it is my honor and privilege to welcome all of you here this evening to the inaugural Reverend Robert L. Beloyne Lecture in Contemporary Theology. This comes at a historic moment in the life of St. Thomas More and in the life of Father Bob, which, as our faith tells us, changes, but does not end in death. When we celebrated the solemnity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary just a few weeks ago on August 15th, we marked the 25th anniversary of Father Bob's arrival to STM. One week later, on the feast of the Queenship of Mary, this community, imbued with Father Bob's spirit of welcome and hospitality, as you know, he made every person with whom he came in contact with feel special. And beloved by God, we welcome 25 new students and their families for Mass. After Mass, they found refreshment and fellowship in our beautiful courtyard just outside these doors. And students from our undergraduate council greeted and toured them through this great center. You could tell how important it was, not only for these new students, but for their families, to know that their daughters and sons were going to be a part of a supportive, vibrant community where they would grow in their Catholic faith in a place that they could call home. Just a week and a half ago, we celebrated the first Sunday Mass of the academic year where the class of 2023 experienced our joy-filled liturgy for the first time. At its conclusion, they, along with their faculty, received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. What a fitting way to begin the school year. 10 minutes before Mass, this was my first, first Mass of the school year as chaplain. I went down into the Riggs garden and standing under a tree just a few feet from Father Bob's final resting place, I asked for his blessing on me, our STM community here and throughout the world, and on our students at the start of this new academic year. It was Sunday. August 25th, the 46th anniversary of Father Bob's ordination to the priesthood, and what a gift. His priesthood is, has been, and continues to be for St. Thomas More, and for the Yale community, for the church. And now, on this night, as we approach the first anniversary of Father Bob's passing from this life, we have the opportunity to express our gratitude and celebrate the gift of Father Bob, which, even from the other side of eternity, continues to impact and bless our lives and the lives of our students, including the newest members of the STM and Yale community. What extraordinary things lay ahead. And we who have been blessed by Father Bob, his wisdom, his sense of humor, his zeal, his love, and his pastoral care through some of the most pivotal times in our church, and the most exciting and transformative periods of growth and development here at St. Thomas More, we get to be a part of it as we will carry on Father Bob's legacy and vision far into the future, thereby impacting generations to come. So welcome and God bless you. And at this time I would invite Carrie Robinson to please come forward.
When I first met Father Bob Boulogne 24 years ago this month, he was radiating energy and enthusiasm for his new ministry as Catholic chaplain at Yale. Just beginning his second year here, he was particularly joyful about a new initiative that he had just introduced at St. Thomas More, small church communities. The workbooks designed in-house, filled with scripture and commentaries that he had written, were hot off the press, and he was beaming at the potential at hand. It would be the first of more than 14 new initiatives and programs Father Bob would create and extend to the Yale Catholic community and beyond. Each one compelling, creative, bold, innovative, inspiring, and deeply effective. Elevating and celebrating Catholic intellectual discourse, forming both minds and hearts, and cultivating adult mature lives of faith in young leaders to benefit the church and the world were the hallmarks of his ministry here. In death as in life, Father Bob was generous, exceedingly so. He left a significant part of his estate to this St. Thomas More community with the intention that we would host an annual lecture in contemporary theology. Tonight, we honor his intention and are deeply grateful to all present and to the many who are joining us through live stream. There is no better person on earth to inaugurate tonight's memorial lecture than Father Ron Rollheiser. And it is not just that Father Ron is a world-renowned spiritual author and acclaimed theologian. It is not only because for four decades he has published a weekly column illuminating contemporary theology syndicated by more than 80 newspapers and media outlets worldwide. You might be tempted to think he is the perfect choice because he is the president of the Oblate School of Theology, served as provincial superior of his Oblate province for six years before that, and is a member of the same religious community as our own Father Carl. His writings are deep, meaningful, accessible, insightful, and ennobling. He is a man of profound integrity, deep faith, rich humor, and sharp intellect. And he is unafraid of addressing difficult topics from suicide to scripture, sexuality to sacred longing. Those are just the S's. <laughs> Make no mistake, these qualifications and biographical details got him on the short list for tonight, to be sure. But what makes our guest the perfect guest this evening is his 40-year, deeply close friendship with our own beloved Father Bob Boulogne. Would you please welcome Father Ron Rollheiser. Thank you. Sounds good, everybody can hear. Well, I want to thank people for inviting me here. This is really is an honor. And especially standing in this room, you know, if you go to New York, they still say that Yankee Stadium is the house that Ruth built. We're in the house that Bob built here. <laughs> okay. and, uh, so it's, it's a great honor to give this lecture in kind of a, uh, a responsibility. Um, I don't, want to, I don't want to screw this up <laughs> for Bob's sake. Now, the topic, and I, I give it to you double, you have it on paper, you have it on um, the screen, and it's, um, it's kind of a, when you say maybe, maybe a pretentious title, Academics Beyond Ideology, Fashion and Fad, Some Principles for a More Genuine Sincerity and Authenticity Within Our Learning. We can put it much more simply. I want to talk to you about what constitutes honest learning. You know, you're in one of the great centers of learning, and certainly United States and maybe anywhere, you know, um, but what constitutes honest learning? I want to do three things, two of them much more rapidly and then something at, more, at, at, at greater length. I want to talk a little bit about just to, the struggle to name the issue. 
for honest learning, then a little bit what happens when we don't learn honestly. But mostly I want to give you what I call 10 commandments for honest learning. Okay. Uh, I want to start with, a, with just a simple little story. But I use the story that I call for a hermeneutical key. A hermeneutical, hermeneutical key is like the, the overture at an opera. It kind of gives you the opera in, 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 in two minutes. Okay. It's a simple story. When I was a graduate student, just the year I was ordained, and I was still doing some seminary studies, but I was also doing some graduate work in psychology at the University of Alberta. And I'm in this graduate class, and we're all young, sophisticated people, um, showing off how smart we were. <laughs> okay. And we had a great professor, it was a very good course. But about halfway through the semester one day, a young Franciscan in class asked a question, and the question just stunned me. Not because it was so deep, because it was honest. This young man actually wanted to know and I realized the rest of us, we don't. <laughs> we're showing off, we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, young people speaking, whether it rings true and so on. We weren't really there to learn. And we weren't really there to actually honestly search. You know, for myself, seminarian just ordained, it was like being slapped in the face. I thought, this guy's honest, I'm not. You know, well, what constitutes honest learning? Okay. Well, I'm going to begin with the struggle. Okay. And here, the, the first two parts, I just want to do them more rapidly. Uh, hopefully the caption kind of tells you what, what's in it. And the first I call the struggle for sincerity to truly know who we are and what we really think. You know the word sincere. The word sincere comes from two Latin words, sine cherry, which sine is without, and cherry is wax. <laughs> Something without wax, something without makeup on, something that's just rawly and nakedly itself, okay? But, you know, I, I'm really convinced that one of the hardest struggles in our lives is to come to sincerity. You know, what do I really think? Who am I really? What do I really believe on this, on this subject and so on? You know, today, for instance, in this country, we're deeply, deeply divided. And we watch the news at night, but becoming more convinced that people are watching each other watch the news. And the liberals are responding to conservatives, conservative to liberals, and so further. So, you know, what do we really believe? You know, who am I really? <laughs> One of my nephews, when he was finishing college this last year, he ran out of money. And so he was just flopping on people's couches to try to get through this last semester and hopefully find a free meal somewhere. So, so one Sunday after mass, he was at mass, and one of my sisters was living in the city. She said, no, Dale, if, if you get really desperate, you can come live at my house. And he said, in all sincerity, he said, how would I know if I'm desperate? <laughs> OK, <laughs> OK, OK. Well, how do we know if we're sincere? <laughs> That's the first struggle, you know. Then secondly, the struggle with infectious ideologies. You know, we live and there's just, you know, the, the, if your drinking water isn't pure, it wreaks havoc on your health. But the air we breathe, the news we listen to, the magazines we read, every, everybody has an angle. You know, it's not necessarily the angle's bad, you know, but it's so hard to, to get beyond that. I'll give you just one example, it's a salient example. You know when they do studies, you know, actual Pew type studies on say attitudes for abortion in this country, they find out that 85% of Americans would actually agree on the issue of abortion. But there's such powerful lobbies and ideologies on both sides that we can't even talk about it. You know, so we're getting ever more polarized an issue that in fact 85% of Americans would agree on and so on. See, but we, 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 we breathe in the ideology the way we drink in water that isn't pure. Okay. Benjamin Franklin once proposed a toast and he says, you know, he said in, in wine there is truth. He said, in beer there is freedom, and in water there is bacteria. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. And in the air we breathe, you know, Bob would have liked that one, okay. Then, then the struggle with our own egos, and I say this sympathetically, you know, we, we are just ego-driven, 
And then invariably in our learning, we're developing our talents for self-promotion. And then what happens is our talents, they become weapons of envy and, and weapons of self-promotion that just draw, so that we're threatened by each other's talents. And for good reasons, you know. Um, that's a defect, that's a fault in our learning. And then finally, very importantly, the struggle with our culture's emphasis on ultra-sophistication. You know, in our culture, one of the, the air that we breathe, the water we drink, everything is about who's the fastest, who's the best, who's the brightest, who's the best looking, who's been more places, who's done more things, and so on, that all the emphasis is on sophistication. And we see it, you know, in just the frantic thing we see today where everybody has a cell phone in their hand at all times, and not only has a cell phone, do you try to get one that's a little faster, a little quicker, a little more up to date, that gets more information and so on. Not that any of these things are bad, they're changing our psyche. I'm not sure we realize what, what's it doing to our psyche, but there, there's already a drive of who is the most sophisticated. And you're gonna see as we see from the next thing, the result of that, is that, that we're graduating students who are brilliant but not equally compassionate. I'm gonna talk about that with the Ten Commandments. That brilliance has to be, all learning has to be linked to compassion. That all growth in intelligence, as we're growing, if it's not equally growing in compassion, we're gonna be one-sided. You're gonna be very bright, but you won't be very wise. Wisdom, simply defined, is intelligence that's linked with compassion. So today, by and large, I'm not picking on Yale, <laughs> I'm picking on everybody. You know, we're graduating students who tend to be brilliant, but not compassionate, not equally compassionate. Then also, graduating students who are brilliant, but are unable, unable to heal others. So, you know, we, we have, I've been in the academic world for a long time. Now, if I look at the last 40 or 50 years, we've had the most brilliant academics ever on this planet by a long shot but sometimes we can't agree on how to build a toilet. You know, and we, you know, see, so we have all this brilliance and we've done all this marvelous work on deconstruction and analysis and so on, but we can't heal anybody. And mostly we can't heal ourselves either. You know, see that, that there's a fault in our learning. Then, a society in a world that's becoming more, that more and more mirrors the Tower of Babel. You know, it's a great story. You know, we, we, as Christians, we've always, you know, really, you know, used and utilized a lot the Adam and Eve story. It's an important story. But there's about eight other stories at the beginning of Genesis, and they're all equally important. And they're all kind of archetypal stories of, you know, why the world is as it is. Okay, original sin's one story. But let me look at the story of the Tower of Babel. They say, in the beginning, you know, they don't say once upon a time in scripture. In the beginning, meaning before time is the way it is now, but it explains why time is the way it is now. They said there was a town called Babel, and the town said to itself, let's make a name for ourselves. Notice why they're gonna build this tower to heaven. Let's make a name for ourselves that all the other towns have to admire us. So they started building this tower to heaven. They said, and as they began to build the tower, God scattered their tongues, and after a while they couldn't speak to each other anymore. All the different languages developed, and they, they scattered to the ends of the earth, and there was no tower, and they couldn't communicate anymore. That's not the origin of languages. That is the origin of human division, and so on. But notice why they did it. Let's make a name for ourselves. We're gonna be so brilliant and bright and attractive that everybody has to like us, and that's the reason they hate us, okay. You know, but it's also, those are the deep divisions, the origin of divisions. You know, if you read Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, where he describes the first Pentecost, notice Luke uses the first Pentecost as the tongues came down and they united. At Babel, the tongues divided. At Pentecost, they come down and you have one fire. It's the fire of the Holy Spirit. One tongue, one language, and so on. But today, our learning is so much dividing us. We're getting brighter. We're getting more brilliant. We know more things. We're drifting further and further from each other. Can't understand each other. Then, deep, irreparable, um, bitter divisions within our country, our churches, and our families 
which all our learning is powerless to heal. You know, we do, we can heal somewhat, but you know, this country is probably more divided now than ever since the Civil War. It's true for the world, it's true for the churches, it's true for, and so on, all these divisions. Now, we have all this knowledge, and we can't heal, okay? And then a society which now divides, this sounds trite, but it's not. A society now divides us up into winners and losers, resulting in a groundswell of inchoate resentment on one side and an intensification of pride on the other side, which among other things leads to the massive murders and the shootings you see on your screen. You know, um, something is amiss, but it starts with our learning not just the University of Yale and so on, it starts already in kindergarten, the playground where you're a loser and he's a winner and so on. And, um, education is about, you're gonna see my last commandment is that you take the word winner and loser and strick it from your thought and vocabulary forever. <laughs> that is not a helpful concept. It's a deeply divisive one. Now, more importantly to the positive. Okay, what are our commandments for learning, okay. Link your learning to a transpersonal vocation. Each time I'm gonna give you a little caption that says, the gifts that God gave you are ultimately intended for everyone. You know, when you read our Christian scriptures, which begin with the Jewish scriptures, okay, and begins with the blessing, you know, the, the covenant that God makes with Israel. And God says to Israel, I'm gonna call you out specially, and I'm gonna bless you specially as a nation, which is also true today for our churches. We're specially blessed by God as a nation, but God puts a caveat there, he says, I'm blessing you that through you, everybody else will be blessed. Notice the blessing doesn't stop with you. You receive this blessing so that through you, everybody else may be blessed. Your gifts are not your own. One of the things that scripture makes clear to us, you know, you don't own your person. You don't own your gifts. They're gifts given to you on trust. That's why the image of, of anthropology in scripture is you're, you're the steward of your own gifts. The gifts are God's. You just get to, <laughs> you're supposed to be a, a good manager and a good steward and so on. But every gift that's given to you or given to me is actually intended for other people. See, but... And, and that's also, that's the very definition of a vocation. A vocation is not so much whether you're in a convent or a rectory or a seminary or you're single or you're married. It's the same story. Whether you're using every God-given talent, especially your special talents, for other people rather than for what makes for good life for me. And see, if, if, if in our learning, the first thing is that we link our learning and everything we're doing as what am I going to do with this? You know, um, met a commencement speaker at our school some years ago, very successful man, and he said he was the first person in his family to ever get a doctorate. And he said, my grandmother came to the commencement ceremony. He said, and I thought she'd be impressed. He said, she wasn't. She came out and said, now what are you going to do with all that learning? <laughs> he said, what are you gonna do with all that learning? See, the learning is never for ourselves, it's for things beyond us. Then secondly, to link all growth in learning to an equal growth in compassion. Be wise and not just bright. You know, we have a lot of bright people in our world. We don't have a lot of wise people in our world. And what's the difference just between this person's really bright, they're really intelligent, you know, and this person's wise. One word, if your brilliance, your learning is equally yoked with compassion, then you'll be a wise person, you'll be a wise woman, you'll be a wise man. If not, you might be a very bright person and you're not gonna understand why half the things are happening in our world. You'll be watching the news with some anger, and you're wondering why people are killing themselves, you won't understand your own kids, and, and on and on and on. You know, so that um, it has to be linked to compassion. A little footnote here, because I know he taught here, but Henry Nouwen was one of the most eloquent spiritual writers on compassion in this last century, you know. And, um, and remember he said, to, 
if you're a compassionate person, every time you're watching the news, every time you see a mass murder and so on, you understand why it's happening. You know, saying, what in the hell is happening in our world and so on, you know why. Because you, you know it inside of yourself and so on. Um, see, if our learning is, is, is yoked with compassion, um, we become wise. Then thirdly, strive to be a truly critical thinker. Be a judge that makes sure that there's a fair hearing. Now, why the word judge here? Well, you know the word critical. In Greek, just put a K where you have a C there. And the, in, in Greek, the word kritus is the judge. See, in English, you say, you know, the judge is on the bench, you know. In Greek, it's the kritus, you know. And the, the, the function of a judge is to make sure there's a fair hearing. You know, the judge isn't supposed to favor one side or the other. The purpose, of the, the function of a judge, he's or she is supposed to make sure the hearing's fair. So when you're learning, you know, be a truly critical thinker, which means just to make sure that, you know, all sides are being heard fairly, not just the liberal side, or the conservative side, or Trump side, or the anti-Trump people, or whatever. You know, you know, everybody's being heard, you know? See, we, we, we use the word critical thinking a lot, but there's very little genuine th critical thinking mm -hmm. at all levels. And again, I say it sympathetically, because it's so hard to get there, you know? Um, so I'll give you an example, and I hope these examples won't offend anybody, but take, take the Supreme Court. These are sincere, bright people, but the liberals are gonna land on one side and conservatives are gonna land on the other side all the time. You know, where's the kritus? <laughs> where's the criticalness, you know? Obviously, we're, we're, land we're landing on the sides because of a pre-ideology, because of a pre-ontology, which are fancy words for a bias, you know? See, in, in philosophy, we don't use words like bias, that's too, we say, you have a pre-ontology. You know, you know, it's a wonderful word, you know. Um, you know, normal, pe ordinary people have biases in philosophy, we have pre-ontologies, okay. You know, see, then we're not critical, we're not hearing, you know. Then, fourthly, try to inoculate yourself against ideology, okay. It's a strong word. Try to inoculate yourself against the ideology. Don't be a liberal. Don't be a conservative. Be compassionate and go where that takes you. I got that last quote from Jim Wallace, the Sojourner's person in Washington. You know, it says, don't be a liberal. Don't be a conservative. Be a woman or a man of compassion and see where that takes you. You know, I defy any of you in this room tonight, if you read the New Testament, you know, just the, the Gospels, not all the interpretations of the Gospels. Just read the Gospels and ask yourself, was Jesus a liberal or a conservative? And you won't be able to answer that question. You will not be answered, able to answer that question. Jesus is a man of deep, profound compassion. And he took him along many different edges, you know. And, um, and that's true for us too, you know. You know, when it was provincial of our order, I was living in our provincial house and our retirement home was connected and um, we always had around the clock nursing staff for our, our seniors and so on. So one day all these nurses were sitting around, they were talking and they were talking about, you know, their Enneagram numbers, their Myers-Briggs numbers, what's your number here, this number, and they asked this one nurse was kind of quiet, said, what's your number? She said, I have an unlisted number. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, in terms of liberal conservative, get yourself an unlisted number, you know. Be like Jesus said, I'm just going to try to be compassionate in every situation and, and with, without pre-thinking, well, is this a liberal solution, it's a conservative solution, and so on. What's the compassionate solution? Don't be a liberal, don't be a conservative, be a man or woman of compassion. Now, fifth. Okay. Make space in your, in your learning for the non-pragmatic. At its highest point, learning exists for its own sake. Um, Thomas Merton, great spiritual writer and thinker, he was once asked, some journalist asked him, he says, uh, Father, Father Merton, what do you, what do you define as the leading spiritual disease in North America? Now, it's interesting to ask this question. What do you think is the leading spiritual disease in this country? Okay, 
of all the things he might have said, you know, we lack social justice or a sexual ethos or a pampered culture or whatever. He didn't say any of those. He says uh, efficiency. He said efficiency. He said because from the White House down to the nursery, the plant has to run, and by the time they keep the plant running, there's no time or energy for anything else. <laughs> We're an efficient culture, you know. It's the reason we don't pray a lot, you know, because first of all, praying is completely useless as a pragmatic activity. <laughs> We're not used to doing useless things, you know, so that um, you know pragmatism. And in fact, American culture, the rest of the world. Of course, the rest that they're catching up now to us and so on, but we've always defined America as pragmatism. That the word pragmatism, they hook America to it, you know? And your great philosopher John Dewey and so on, you know, see, prior to Dewey, in European thought, truth was always defined um, theoretically. So for Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, truth was what they said in Latin, adequatio intellectus ad rei, the adequation of the intellect to the thing. See, so for Thomas Aquinas say, if you look out there and you say there's an island, if there's an island out there, it's true. If there's no island out there, it's a mirage, you know. <laughs> See, so that truth, what's inside of your head has to correspond to what's outside of your head. Dewey said, well, that's European. Dewey said, you know what's true? Truth is what works. Truth is what works. So he gave us a pragmatic definition of truth. You know, you can have the nicest theory in the world if it doesn't cure a headache or it doesn't cure cancer, it doesn't fly an airplane, it doesn't do you any good. And that's deep inside the American soul. And now it's deep inside of the Chinese soul and the Japanese soul and a lot of other souls too. But the Americans were there first. <laughs> you know, but it's so deep that we always have to be doing something. You know, um, and see, so that learning for us always has a pragmatic aim. I'm going to get a good job, or this is going to happen. I'm going to learn it so I can do this other thing with it, and so on. Um, you know, the best, the greatest, to my mind, book written on universities is the way back to Cardinal Henry Newman, who's to be canonized this next month. You know, Henry Newman wrote this book 100 years ago, 150 years ago, called The Idea of a University. And it's still one of the great philosophies of learning. And, and Newman says, the first function of learning, it's for its own sake, not for anything else. Actually, what does that mean, something for its own sake? Just a simple kind of an example. Imagine if you sit down tonight and you listen to uh, a symphony by Beethoven because you're teaching a class on it tomorrow and you want to be sharp on it. See, you're listening to a symphony, which is a beautiful piece of music, but you're listening to it in function of something else. If you go home tonight and turn on and just listen to a symphony of Beethoven just because it's beautiful, that's non-pragmatic. But we find all non-pragmatic things hard to do, especially inside of our learning. You know, why should I learn a foreign language if I'm never going to use it? Why should I study philosophy if I'm never going to use it? Why should I do this if I'm never going to use it? And so on. And it limits our learning. So that universities, the danger with universities is that we're going to soon become trade schools. And you're going to have this, it's going to be hard to distinguish universities from trade schools. And in university, the, the faculties that do pure learning, philosophy, stuff, notice they're all shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Um, Everybody's in computer science and something else and so on, because that's going to get you a job. And I mean, those are real considerations, but it, it, it limits. That's, then we end up having very bright people who aren't very educated. You know, um, you know when, when I graduated from high school in 1965 in Saskatchewan, you know, which actually has pretty high standards of education. At that time, you couldn't, get a, you couldn't get into the University of Saskatchewan if you didn't have at least one foreign language. They actually wanted two. You had to have two, two uh, things in English, you had something in psychology, all these. You know, it didn't matter if you were becoming a doctor. You had to know all this stuff. Today, no. You just, science is science, and this is this, and so on. Um, we're becoming very unpragmatic. But that changes our thinking. It was that, you, know, you know what one of our greatest obstacles to prayer is? Prayer is non-pragmatic. So you find it hard, first of all, to disengage yourself from whatever you're doing, just to sit down to pray, because now you're not doing anything. 
But then when you sit down to pray, you, you, very soon another problem arises. You said, I'm going to pray. As soon as you sit down, your mind, you start doing things. You know, when I get home, I got to stop, buy some groceries, do this. You're planning tomorrow's agenda. You're doing all kinds of stuff. And all kinds of stuff rushes in, what you need to do. See, pragmatism, it's taking us. And it's wonderful uh, in its own way, but uh, it's one-sided. Okay. Then... Don't use your subject matter one-sidedly. Let it change you as you dialogue with it. Tr true learning is predicated on a genuine mutuality between the learner and the subject. You know, in the last point, I made this point where I said, the best book ever written on that is John Henry Newman, The Idea of a University. Here, I want to tip you another book. The Quaker Parker Palmer, who's written a magnificent book, but probably his, his, his deepest contribution is his book on a spirituality of education which is called to, to, um, to Know As We Are Known. And it's a beautiful book. If you're going to be a teacher or whatever, read this, um, or just as a learner, that when you're engaging a subject, you're not just there to manipulate the subject. It's meant to manipulate you. <laughs> you're to do things with this, but this is the dialogue. You know, and he, he, he stretches this a long ways and in a beautiful way. He says that even if you're doing ecological work and stuff, that tree has a soul. The tree is talking to you. It's also trying to save you. You're not just trying to save the tree and so on. Um, so true learning is predicated. There's a mutuality. The, what we're, doesn't matter if you're doing even computer science or whatever, it's also speaking to you. You're not learning something from it, and so on. Then, number seven, true, be a true agnostic who never closes the door on further investigations. And I'm give you that next quote comes from John of the Cross, the great Carmelite mystic. John of the Cross says, every year as you age, so every year as you age, doesn't matter what you age, just said, begin to learn more, to understand more by not understanding than by understanding. I repeat that, I slurred it. Learn to understand more by not understanding than by understanding. You know, we have agnostics in the world today. They're not agnostics at all. Most agnostics, they're not agnostics. They're, they, they have a bias and whatever, you know. Um, Thomas Hal Halit, the Czech writer whose books are now Czech, translated to English, wonderful spiritual writer, he has a book called Patience with God, and he says, uh, agnosticism and atheism, that's just another word for somebody who hasn't enough patience with God, you know? Remember with God, one year, one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like one day, and we get pretty impatient. But see, true agnosticism, you never shut the door. You know, the doors are always open, but I wanna use John of the Cross. What does he mean by that? I often make students do a term paper on this. Learn to understand more by not understanding than by understanding. It's this. You know, see, we capture things in thought, in pictures, in concepts, and it kind of works. In fact, it works for quite a while, and it does, but, but it's all limited. So I'll give you a simple example. Imagine someone comes up to you and says, you know, I know you. I think I know you. For instance, I knew Bob for 38 years, you know. See, well, I've known you for all these years. I know your Enneagram number. I know your Myers-Briggs number. You know, I know your family, and you know, I know what your dad was like, and you're, you get, you're like your mother, and so on. They give you all these understandings. Do you feel very understood? No. You feel violated. Okay, no. If somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I've known you for 35 years, and you're a mystery to me, then you feel free. You're actually understood. See, because we're much, much more complex than the pictures and the mental concepts and stuff possess of things we, we do with it that make for each other. You know, imagine, and sometimes our pictures are beautiful. Imagine if you have just a magnificent portrait painted of your mother. You have it up in your bedroom. And it's just somebody really just captured your mother's essence. That's nice, but if your mother's sitting downstairs at the table, it's not your mother. <laughs> and no matter how good it is, it's not your mother. Remember, some years ago, there was a famous play in New York called Children of a Lesser God. Remember that book? And there, so this is kind of the, the storyline. So this, this young woman, 
and she has all these disabilities. She can't speak and she can't hear, but she's very, very bright, and so she can never get a teacher who can teach her because she just chews up her teachers and spits them out. And finally she meets this young man who's a brilliant teacher and a very good young man. And he has the patience, he can match her in intelligence, and he breaks the world open to her. So now she can speak, she can hear with them. Um, and then they fall in love. It's a love story. And they end up getting married, okay? And for a while it's just wonderful. And then at a certain point it all begins to go sour. She has nursing some resentment that she can't name and she feels bad because she's grateful to him and yet she feels boxed in and he's angry with her. He thinks because she's reading feminist books that's turning her against men and then this thing finally it breaks their relationship. And so their last night together, she's sleeping upstairs, he's sleeping downstairs, neither is sleeping a lot, <laughs> okay. And they're pretty angry and she comes down in the morning and says, I need to leave you and it's hard. But she says, um, and I feel so bad because you've been such a great teacher and I owe everything to you. And he said, no, I figured it out last night. He says, I wasn't a great teacher. He said I was a good teacher, but I wasn't a great teacher. He said, I taught you to understand yourself, but not better than I can understand you. He said, I taught you to be free, but not so much that I can't possess you anymore. You know, see, as John of the Cross says, all our concepts, they work for a while. They're wonderful for a while. That picture of her mother is really good for a while, but at a certain point, it's got to be thrown away, you know? Um, you know the difference between an icon and an idol? An idol is simply an icon you've hung on to for too long. <laughs> it starts as a holy picture. It starts wonderful, but at a certain point, it, it has to go. It's not, you know, and that's what the mystic call. Just the, the older we get, the more we need, need to move into darkness. But even young learners in this room already begin to take this seriously. You know, this is wonderful and it's good, but, 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 it, you know, um, it's always more and more and deeper and so on. Which ties to the next point. Um, work towards post-sophistication. Learn how to believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny again. Okay. You know, Paul Ricoeur, the great French philosopher, coined an expression which I could have used here. We call it moving towards second naivete. See, you're born and you're naive. Okay. And then we become more sophisticated and eventually, uh, oftentimes, we stay there. Okay, but sophistication and learning is something we pass through. It's not the final stage. Um, let me give you a couple of examples here. Some years ago, you know, I want to refer to another, another educator here, and that's the famous book by Ellen Blum, who was at the University of Chicago. He's died since, but in 1987, he wrote a famous book called The Closing of the American Mind. The book was equally hated by the liberals and conservatives, which is usually a good sign. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but he begins the book this way. He said, when he was a young man, he said, I was a bright young man. He said, and I won a scholarship to Cornell. You know, and I know how Yale feels about Cornell, but a kid said, it's, a, it's an Ivy League school. And he said, I walked into my first class, I was 19. He said, he had a world-class professor. And he began the class this way. He said, well, he said, you're here from your small parochial backgrounds. He said, I'm going to bathe you in great truth. He said, and I'm going to set you free. And Bloom said that reminded me of a little boy when I was seven years old who told me there was no Santa. He said, but he wasn't setting me free, he was showing off. He said, so was the prof. <laughs> So he said, after I got my mark from this professor, I went to see him, I said, Professor, you know what I learned from you? I learned that I'll forever teach exactly the opposite the way that you do. <laughs> and he said, I've, I've sustained that. He's, he taught at the University of Chicago. He said, I taught very bright young women and men. He said, but I always begin my class the very opposite. He said, they come in and say, well, you're here and you're pretty sophisticated. <laughs> You know a lot of things, you've tasted, experimented, and you said you're very, very sophisticated. He said, so I'm going to try to teach you how to believe in Santa and the Easter Bunny again, so that maybe you'll have some chance to be happy. Isn't that a great line? I'm going to try to teach you how to believe in Santa and the Easter Bunny again, and maybe you'll have some chance to be happy. Okay, now, he wasn't trying to move them back to naivete, 
he was trying to move into his second naivete. Let me give you just a very simple, almost humorous thing. You know, imagine this. Imagine a little kid can just begin to talk, two years old, and the little kid comes up and says, Mommy, where does the sun go at night? You know, they're two years old. Don't bring out an atlas and globes and start showing solar systems to two-year-olds, you know. You say, no, no, it's, it takes a sleep during the night and you take a sleep and, you know, it gets up in the morning and you get up in the morning. Okay. Now when they get to be six or seven, you can't do that anymore. Where does the sun go at night? Then you pull out the atlas and the globes and show them the solar system and what blocks what and so on. Then when they get 15 and 20, that doesn't work anymore either. Then you pull out Stephen Hawking's and you, and, and you teach them about, you know, the Big Bang Theory. And then after a while, you have to pull out astrophysics and Brian Swim and walls of light and so on. And it gets ever more sophisticated. After a while, you can't understand anything anymore. And then when you get 75 years old, they say, what's the sun go at night? It just takes to sleep, gets up in the morning. <laughs> But notice you have to work through that, okay? And see, and that's where both liberal and conservative struggle. See, liberals know, I mean, conservatives know the dangers of sophistication, so they're always trying to block you. Be careful, don't learn, you're gonna, you're gonna learn too much, you're gonna fall away from your faith, this is gonna happen, you're gonna become a feminist, you're gonna become this, you're gonna become that, and so on. Uh, that's a mistake. It's well intentioned, remember, that's Catcher in the Rye, J. David Selinger, a generation ago. That beautiful book, Catcher in the Rye, we all have to read it in college and so on. He said, if we can only just take little kids and just have them in a rye field and get them fenced off so they never have to grow up. They'd always be beautiful, little, innocent kids, you know. But liberals know better. See, liberals think sophistication is a place where you stay. No, it's something you work through, you know. See, that you work through sophistication to become post-sophisticated. You work through that to become naive again in another way. Jesus says this very clearly. Remember, Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, he didn't say childish, you have to become childlike, you know. Um, and sophistication is very, very important. So do your studies. Get a PhD from here, not from the other university, and so on. Um, <laughs> and so on, or better yet, come to our school. We have a PhD program. So learn all this stuff and learn astrophysics and everything you can learn. Um, but it's, first of all, it's to be used for others. And also, that's in the end, it's all just words. When you're 75, 80, you know, retire into poetry and uh, start, you know, putting out Easter baskets and doing other things. Okay. <laughs> then number nine, affirm the gifts of others. Jealousy and lack of blessing are the bane of the academic world. They're actually the bane of all worlds. <laughs> and I always find it interesting. We have 10 commandments from God. Two of them have to do with jealousy. We never preach about them. Notice jealousy is the only commandment that gets two. Even adultery only gets one, you know. And so adultery, one commandment, two commands about jealousy. We never preach about it. It's the bane, first of all, of the academic world. It's the bane of the world in general. And that's why it's, it's so hard for us to simply affirm each other, even for parents to affirm their kids. You know, Daniel Berrigan, um, one of the great Christians of our, of our time, you know. But as you know, Berrigan was always in trouble with somebody. <laughs> you know, governments, bishops, provincial, superiors, authority figures, and so on. He had a wonderful job. When, 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 when he was over 80, he wrote his autobiography. He was deeply reflective. And at one point he says, you know something? He says, uh, my father, he said, my father couldn't bless his sons, myself and Philip. He said, he was always jealous of our talents. He said, it's terrible. He said, my dad simply could not bless us. He said, my mother could. He said, saved my life. He said, my mother could say, Daniel, I'm proud of you. He said, my dad couldn't say that. 
If you wrote a book, you'd say, well, I should have written a book. You're lucky you got an education and so on. He said, is it any wonder that I've been in the thorn of the side of every authority figure? <laughs> was getting even with his father, you know. Now he used it well to do some pretty prophetic work and so on, but he was clear enough to know that the motives that, that he was driven other ways. You know, incident just as a footnote, the absence of the father blessing, anthropologists would say it's probably the deepest hunger for men in the whole world. A good number of men, most men perhaps, have never been blessed by their own father, you know. And um, the wife can give him the blessing, doesn't, doesn't take that wound away. I remember that the very first year I was ordained, <clears throat> it was my first time I ever preached on <clears throat> the baptism of our Lord. You know, it's that beautiful text. We have that Sunday between Christmas and, you know, um, Epiphany and the first Sunday of the year, you know, where we have something called the baptism of our Lord. And the text in Scripture, in the three Gospels, three of the Gospels, they're so beautiful. They said, Jesus went to the Jordan to be baptized by John, and John immersed him in the water. And then when Jesus' head broke the water, notice that's a beautiful image of birth. When a child comes out of the womb, its head breaks the mother's waters. So his head emerges from the water, and the heavens open up, and the voice says, this is my blessed. English translate, beloved. This is my beloved one in whom I am well pleased, in whom I take delight. <clears throat> so for not having a homily, it was a church in Edmonton, I said, well, you know, we were mostly asleep to our baptism. We were infants. <clears throat> and, but just as surely as those words were said over Jesus, they were also said over us. When you were baptized, the heavens opened, and God said, this is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. That should be a safe homily, but it wasn't. Okay. I was in the sacristy investing. It was a Saturday of evening mass. And this young man came in in his 20s, quite agitated. And he says, Father, I just came to church tonight. He said, because I'm out on bail. And Monday is going to be my sentencing. I have to go to prison for a couple of years, you know. He said, so I thought this would help me. He said, but I hate it. I hated the gospel. I hated what you said. I hated it all. He said, because it's not true. It's not true. He says, nobody has ever been pleased by what I've done. He said, least of all, my own father. It's no accident he's going to prison. You know, if you haven't been blessed, there's come a constriction inside of our heart that's hard to get off and so on. You know, but most of us haven't been blessed sufficiently. And then constantly we don't bless others sufficiently. <clears throat> and then all, you know, it, it's so hard for us to simply admire somebody. To ever say, God, aren't you something? You're just, you know, we can't do that because there's a jealousy and so on. Um, and it affects our learning. <clears throat> so in our learning, we're, this crass way of putting it, we're getting even with everybody who ever heard us. <laughs> And we're trying to build up our own weapons of envy and so on. Um, and all that does is it leads to unhappiness inside of us. You know, there's a wonderful poem by Yeats, the Irish poet, one of the most mature things he wrote. And he wrote some fine poetry. But when he was an older man, he wrote a poem once called Vacillation. And I think I can quote the last lines by heart. He said, um, my 60th year had come and gone. He said, and I sat, a solitary man in a crowded London shop, he had an open book and an empty cup on a marble tabletop. He said, while on the street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed. In 20 minutes more or less, it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. He's saying I'm a 60-year-old man plus, and he says, today I feel really good. <laughs> Not because I look like George Clooney anymore, or uh, you know, of all these friends, I'm sitting alone, drained a cup of coffee. Said, I've been blessed, and I can bless. You know, our learning needs to bring us to that. Then finally, um, whoops, I haven't kept up here. Bob would appreciate my sloppiness here. Okay. <laughs> Very simply. Be ever aware of creeping pride and elitism inside of yourself as we're studying, as we're learning, as we're preparing for careers, and strike the words loser and winner from your thoughts and your vocabulary permanently. You know, see, that, that, that temptation always in, in, our, in our learning to set ourselves apart, to set ourselves apart, um, that 
the, and then we're winning, somebody else is losing. Notice, and scripture scholars will tell you, that is the unchristic movement. That is the opposite of Christ movement. You know, the Christ movement is described so beautifully in a, uh, the Philippians hymn, which we pray, it said, though he was in the form of God, Jesus didn't deem equality something to be grasped, but, but rather he emptied himself. He became a human being, then as a human being, he emptied himself further and took on the form of a slave. See, you recognize the Christ movement when you see people climbing downwards, <laughs> but everything inside of us wants to climb upwards, you know, then we're a winner and somebody else is a loser, and so on. Um, that, that's the opposite of learning. That's the opposite of real learning. I want to end with just, um, um, I want to do this first and just with a couple of little Boulogne stories <laughs> and, and a, a tribute to Bob, you know. Um, just a couple of stories, you know. Um, I was living in Edmonton in 1987 and Bob came up to Edmonton to give a, um, I hope this isn't going to be part of the video. <laughs> <laughs> so Bob came to Edmonton to give a retreat to the diocesan priests. You know, there's a big presbyterate up there. And so Bob gives his retreat, and he said he was pretty nervous. And we had, in, in, um, in Edmonton time, we had an old Monsignor, Polish. Uh, he used to glare at the retreat director, and the whole time you're, is this guy going to shoot you or whatever, and so on. And uh, very, very critical. And so Bob said... The old man sitting looking at him the whole retreat and Bob's trying to figure out the murder in his eyes and so on. And so the retreat ends on Friday morning and just as they're thanking him, they thanked him, the old man stands up and said, let me say something here too. And he said, uh, turned to Bob and said, let me tell you something, young man. He said, I have been coming to these retreats for almost 60 years. He said, and I can honestly say I never heard, and Bob said, my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> and he said, somebody speaks so eloquently about the spirituality of diocesan priesthood. He said, now you should put that into a book. You should publish that in a book. He said, except that part in one of your talks where you talked about the LGB community. He said, not that part. He said, that could go into a separate book. <laughs> Bob enjoyed that one. One more. <laughs> Indulge me. The, the month, I, w I was with Bob for three and a half years in Belgium, and we finished our doctorates one month apart, or Bob was ahead of me, so. But in Belgium, when you de defend the doctoral thesis at Levain, it's a big deal. They have a marble hall there that Erasmus taught, and it becomes like this medieval pageant and so on, and a lot of people come. So we were at this, a month before Bob's defense, we were at the defense of a priest from England, you know, who had written a thesis on Karl Rahner, you know. But during the, the scrutinies, one of the professors really, um, took him to task a little bit. He said, you know, you're quoting a lot in Germany. He said, I'm going to test your German right now. He said, how well do you know it? Were you going through translations and so on? So it was a little awkward moment, you know. So Bob had done a lot of his thesis with Latin, you know, and Bob's Latin wasn't any better than mine. <laughs> So at the, at the reception afterwards, Bob goes over to his professor and said, Professor, I'm defending in a, in a month, and you're on my, my, my board. He said, let me tell you something. If you ask me that question, I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to come over and hit you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to conclude, I, I knew Bob for the last 38 years of his life, for nearly 40 years, and so on. Um, and. I, when I think of Bob, I always think, first of all, that the qualities, they're just in a natural, wonderful exuberance was there all the time. Look at every picture of Bob, there's something in his eye, there's a mischievousness there, there's humor, there was this powerful zest for life. Um, but don't be fooled by that. And as curious at the beginning, his deep quality, he was a generous man, you know. So Bob taught me a lot about generosity and so on, which I'll ever be deeply grateful for. Um, you were very blessed to have him as chaplain here. And I hope that this lecture, which is the inaugural lecture, I hope 100 years from now, uh, there is still a Bob Boulogne lecture here, you know. And I hope you, you find ways of publishing these and have a book here at Thomas Moore with, that, that honors Bob and all these lectures. So again, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, Father Ron. And what, a, what an outstanding way to begin this first of 100 years <laughs> of Father Robert Beloyne lectures. That, wonderful, thank you. Gave us much to think about and to pray about. And I know that uh, we're grateful that you're going to be sticking around and celebrating with us afterwards. And so any questions or conversation, Father Ron's going to be with us. So thank you. In the gospel, just before he revealed himself as the good shepherd, Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. For Father Bob, our good shepherd, these words of Christ were his favorite verse in all of scripture. And they're inscribed, as most of you know, above the doors through which we entered this lecture hall. I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. They imbued Father Bob's ministry as a priest of Jesus Christ, and they inform our mission here at St. Thomas More. What we're about here is grounded in the mission of Jesus Christ, so that those who come here experience and are nurtured in the abundant life they receive in their relationship with God, falling in love with God, and so become, as Father Ron urged us to become more compassionate. Here they are created and recreated, indeed transformed, so as to become, to become abundant life for others going out into the world as Christ's love, his hands and feet. This matters in a particular way because we're working with Yale students. The best and the brightest students in the world, if I can push the elitism just, <laughs> just for a moment. <laughs> the English translation of the Latin inscription over the chapel door is to the greatest God under the calling of St. Thomas More, martyr. And it reminds us of the great saint for which we are named. Thomas More was a lawyer and a jurist and eventually the Lord High Chancellor of England under Henry VIII. The S chain he wore around his neck indicated that he was the wisest and second most powerful person in the realm. Moore did not achieve his position because he was the holiest, but because, in part having been educated in an institution similar in stature to Yale in England, he possessed both the intelligence and the discipline required to achieve excellence. As a Catholic Christian, however, his faith and his integrity enabled him in his capacity as jurist and chancellor to seek to do good, not only for the realm, but for all, regardless of one's rank, power, or privilege. Thomas More was a saint because he lived his vocation so excellently in the world so as to emulate the person of Jesus Christ in his work. Our mission here at STM is to create and transform students after the heart and in the spirit of St. Thomas More so that no matter where they go or what they do in the world, they will strive to do good and so become saints in how they influence it. We, all of us here, have the privilege, indeed the moral responsibility, to nurture Yale students in the abundant life of Jesus Christ because they, having been blessed, will be the ones who will change, shape, and lead this world and please God, our church, in a myriad of ways. This evening, as we look forward to STM's future, 
I cannot forget one more individual who, like St. Thomas More and Father Bob, directed his vision toward the creation of the community we are so proud, so grateful, and so indebted to preserving for generations of Yale students to come. I personally draw tremendous hope and responsibility in the visionary words of Father T. Lorison Riggs, our chapel's founder, whose eloquent case for support in 1937 reads as relevant today as it did 82 years ago during the campaign to build Morehouse for Yale students. And I quote, they need to grow in the faith rather than merely keep it to learn more and more of the significance of their Catholic heritage, to look upon their religious education, in short, not as completed by their learning of their childhood's catechism, but as never ending and as calling for special effort while they're developing intellectually in other ways." End quote. With that, my friends, I invite you to join us in STM's long tradition of nurturing Catholic life on campus by introducing the Reverend Robert L. Boulogne Faith in Action Fund. At this time, it is my privilege and honor to welcome Harry Attridge, the chairman of the STM Board of Trustees, to please come forward. It's really hard to uh, follow such eloquence, uh, both Father Ron's and Father Ryan's, uh, but that's what they make uh, members of the Board of Trustees for. <laughs> So uh, I just want to say a word or two about uh, what Father Ryan has just announced. That is that we're in the uh, process of starting a new campaign uh, to support the efforts of uh, St. Thomas More, the Father uh, Bob Boulogne Faith in Action Fund. Uh, what will this fund do? It will do many of the things and continue to support and expand many of the things that Father Bob was committed to. The small Christian communities, uh, the soup kitchen, this lectureship and the publications that probably will ensue from it. All of these things are things that are currently underway that Bob really uh, valued very highly and that we will support through this fund. We'll also be doing something new. One of the things that's been on the agenda for some time is to create a fund for student initiatives to enable them to put faith into action in new and creative ways. A little bit like the Psy uh, Fund here at Yale, a Catholic version of that. In any case, to enable students who have creativity, imagination, and energy uh, to put their faith into action in new ways by funding things that um, will support their efforts. These um, efforts can perhaps take the, um, uh, the tack of alleviating poverty and dealing with some of the social situations that confront us here in New Haven. Uh, they could take the tack of confronting global issues uh, uh, global warming and the environment, the sorts of things that uh, the Pope has addressed in uh, Laudato Si. In any case, it'll be the student initiatives uh, that will take the, uh, the lead in this. Uh, and these uh, initiatives will also uh, need some new housing. As you might have noticed, we're in the process of renovating Linwood Place right next door. And uh, some of the funds that uh, come in for this um, uh, Father Boulogne initiative will provide space for the students and the support staff that are engaged in these programs. How can you help? You know, you know the motto, <laughs> study, act, or study, pray, and act. Where are you going to study? Well, you have something on your chairs, and this is uh, a place to begin. Uh, if you haven't read it already, this uh, outlines in a brief way some of the things that are going to be undertaken by the Father Bob Boulogne Initiative. If you have other questions, uh, Connor me or F uh, Father Ryan or uh, Margaret Okasiuk. Uh, Margaret, are you here? In any case, uh, any of the team uh, will be able to give you an update on what the initiatives are. Pray. 
pray every day how you can enact the generosity that Father Bob Beloyne uh, himself embodied and that he taught us to, to try to follow. You can pray too tonight over reception uh, materials in the, um, uh, the room next door and that prayer too will be in Bob's memory because he so loved receptions like the one we're going to give. <laughs> And uh, finally, uh, you can act. And there are two actions that you can take. Uh, one is to receive. And um, uh, something that's available for you tonight is um, a book of Bob's sermons that has been edited and prepared with photographs in a beautiful way. Uh, the staff has done a marvelous job on this. Now, there's one little catch. There's always a catch, isn't there? Uh, there is a little card that you have to fill out uh, that's there on your seat. When you fill out this card and give it to the folk in the um, room next door, you will get this book free of charge. <laughs> okay. There is also, by the way, another little card in the book, which if you're inspired, you can fill out. Um, but this is something you might want to take home and pray over. And this is a card that says, I want to give a million dollars, or whatever it is that you want to give. <laughs> uh, in any case, study. Uh, pray and act. Act with generosity. Act in the way that Bob would want you to act uh, in his honor and in his name and will carry on the mission of St. Thomas More. The board, by the way, the Board of Trustees has already taken the initiative in this matter. Uh, we have um, uh, donations in place for some $350,000 or pledges for donations for some $350,000. And we also have uh, Bob's uh, own uh, legacy and an, uh, another gift uh, of $100,000, bringing us up to about a half a million toward our goal. So we're already on a good foundation for pushing this effort forward. Uh, we count on you all to be part of this whole thing. Thank you for being here tonight and thank you for giving this your serious consideration.